It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Charles Clark. Charles is a theoretical atomic, molecular, and optical physicist at the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology, where he is a fellow and serves as the NIST co-director of the Joint Quantum Institute of NIST and the University of Maryland. He is also the physical sciences editor of the NIST Digital Library of Mathematical Functions and co-editor of the NIST Handbook of Mathematical Functions. Previously, he served as the Chief of Electron and Optical Physics Division at NIST and as Program Manager for Atomic and Molecular Physics at the Office of Naval Research. His main research activities have been in the area of ultra-cold gases, quantum information and communications, and atomic and molecular phenomena on surfaces in condensed matter and in nuclear reactions. He is a fellow of the National Institute of Sciences and Technology, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Institute of Physics, the Obstacle Society of America, and the American Physical Society. He has received numerous awards for his research and service, including NIST's Condon Award twice, the Mahan Prize of the Optical Society of America, the U.S. Department of Commerce Silver and Gold Medals, and the NIST Bronze Medal. He has served on numerous editorial review and advisory boards and has been an author on several hundred research publications. Charles earned a BA in math and physics at Western Washington State College and an MS and PhD in physics at the University of Chicago. His talk tonight is entitled Over the Rainbow, Other Worlds Seen by Animals. Please hold your questions to the end in the question and answer period and join me in welcoming Charles to the podium. Thank you very much. Oh, there it is. Well, thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, this is the International Year of Light. Uh, there was a uh, celebration at the National Academy of Sciences uh, last weekend. I was privileged to attend. And um, my talk is really about light. Uh, the animals are there as an example of uh, sort of a research revolution that occurred starting in about the year 2000 that's led to amazing uh, understanding of a world seen by animals that's invisible to us. But it's based on the, um, their ability to perceive light on what I call the other side of the rainbow, that two regions of the spectrum that um, are, are very close to our own, but for, which were unknown to humanity for many, many years. So I'm going to use the rainbow as an organizing theme for discussing light. And the, the rainbow, of course, is produced uh, in most people's experience by the dispersion of natural light from the sun and other stars. And there's also been tremendous developments in the past several decades in understanding uh, the universe at large from uh, observations of light and then also in these adjunct reasons, the ultra ultraviolet and the infrared in particular. And um, there, as I was saying, there are many discoveries about the ability of uh, primarily birds insects, uh, various types of crustaceans to um, perceive the world in a way that we don't see. And the ability to understand that has also grown a lot due to a development of technology like making possible low cost, uh, high resolution, ultraviolet and infrared cameras available to members of the general public. So the messages of my talk. Uh, things known to you, but let's look at them again from a, a, a new perspective. White light, uh, the ordinary light of the sun, uh, is a mixture of colors and other things. So the fact that white light was a mixture of colors is actually uh, ra uh, rather, occurs rather late in human perception of light. It was uh, first shown by Isaac Newton, a very foundational experiment that, that laid the grounds of modern optics. Um, then I'll talk about the two 
great experiments that were done, uh, one in, I guess, uh, 1799, one in 1801, that discovered that there was light, outs or something very much like light, outside the range of our vision. And both of these experiments, I think they're so simple but so amazing because they involve a very simple observation and then a, what seems like a straightforward interpretation. And if you uh, remember anything about the actual science from this talk, I hope it's, it's something about those great discoveries. And then a little bit more on the light from the sun in a generalized sense and, and finally some uh, lessons from plants and animals. So here is, uh, I guess this is probably taken from Wikipedia. Uh, it's, it's, a case, it's a case of a, a white light coming into a prism, and then, uh, then there emerges from the prism this stream of you know, red, yellow, and blue colors. A uh, phenomenon you've all seen. It's, you've seen the rainbow as well. So this was a phenomenon that was known to the ancients that uh, you know, they, they were able to make glass and see, see the spread of colors. But the idea, the prevailing ideas were that the glass had some effect on the light that went into it and changed it. It impressed something on the, the white light. Now, we, uh, our perception of colors is based on the fact that in the eye there are three receptors uh, that are sensitive to different parts of the spectrum. So this is something from the, you know, stated from our modern knowledge. Uh, light is a form of electromagnetic radiation, and the human visual range uh, runs at wavelengths from 400 to 700 nanometers, uh, about half a micron in size. And there are three receptors that are sensitive to the different parts of the spectrum, uh, blue, green, and red. And so, uh, you know, our modern understanding of what you see from a rainbow is that basically all the colors that can be seen by the human eye are contained to some degree in this, in this mixed spectrum. I suppose, I suppose many of you are familiar with the RGB color system from working with PowerPoint on your computer. There's a 24-bit uh, color scale eight bits each for red, green, and blue. Uh, I, I heard there were no questions uh, allowed during the talk, but I'm going to ask the questions and we'll accept answers. So uh, let's, let's say here's, uh, here is the pure red. I'm sorry if you can't read it. It says it's 255 uh, value for red, eight bits of red, zero of green, and zero of blue. Here is... Uh, the opposite of red, zero red, 255 green, 255 blue. Anyone care to name that color? Cyan. So RGB, red, green, blue, uh, is this one system of colors. And then there's the, the complementary system, CMY, cyan, I don't know if it's in the right order, cyan, magenta, and yellow. So here is cyan. Uh, Yellow is, cyan is not red. It's the two's complement of red. Cyan, oh, so yellow. Anyone? Let's see, did I say yellow? Yeah, yellow is not blue. It's, uh, it's equal combination of green, red. And magenta, not green. Uh, so here's, you know, let's look at the rainbow again. What's in the rainbow? Um, so, the, you know, there's a feeling that all the colors that, appear, that we can see appear in the rainbow because it's, it takes white light and spreads it out. I guess maybe I didn't mention who it was that first discovered that the prism was only separating colors out of light. It didn't actually affect the light itself. Anyone? Newton, and it was, again, one of these amazing, amazingly simple experiments, and what was done by Newton, I mean an outline, is that he had a, uh, a, a hole in a screen in a dark room through which the sun's light was coming, and he spread out the colors 
by a prism, and then he took another prism and another hole and just picked out the blue and found that the blue passed through the second prism without being further dispersed. So that was an example of a, of a pure color. And then, of course, it's possible to, to recombine all those separated colors and get back the white. In fact, every time you, um, you place a... Uh, every time you place a... Um, cell phone call, you're causing that to be done by the telecommunications network, which uses a system of, of um, channel capacity expansion of s literally physically spreading out light into different streams, modulating the separate streams, recombining them and sending them down a, a fiber optic. Well, here's, here was one big surprise. Uh, could we, is it possible to have the front lights brought down just a little bit? Uh, one big surprise in understanding the light from the sun, uh, it was looked at with very high spectral resolution by uh, Joseph Fraunhofer uh, in the early part of the 19th century. So this is, this is, a, this is the rainbow representation, but it's as if you, you cut the rainbow up into little strips and then put one on, so you're running from red down to yellow, green, blue like this, by cutting it up into strips and so, and, and piling them up, because there's, it, there's such a long, dispersed view of the spectrum of the sun that it couldn't, it couldn't fit on one slide. And what is seen is that the light of the sun is full of holes. Oh, this is actually, this is data from the sun taken at the National Optical Astronomy Observatory, but this, this type of, uh, this, this, these, this structure was seen in the early 19th century by Fraunhofer, who, uh, as I understand it, he was working under a contract from the Venetian glass industry to find the most pure glass that could be made. He was a specialist in making optical glass, and the way he would do it was to make a prism out of, of samples of candidate glass, uh, view the sun through the prism, and then if there, was, you know, if there was dirt in the glass, the prisms would go into the garbage heap. And I guess at, at one point, the garbage heap was overflowing when it occurred to Fraunhofer that maybe the problem wasn't with the glass, but with the sun. And he proved it was with the sun. This is in like 1810 or something like that. So how, how would you prove that the problem is with the sun? For example, you know, it could be that there's something in the Earth's atmosphere. Because let's just say there were no uh, spaceships flying around in those days. No one could see, no one could look at the sun except through the atmosphere. So that was presumably a candidate mechanism. But Fraunhofer showed that it wasn't true. And again, it's by an observation, which admittedly, if you went home and tried to do it tonight, you might have to work a while on it. But conceptually, it's very simple. Fraunhofer simply observed the spectra of other, did the same thing to spectra of other stars. For example, the star Sirius, relatively bright. He performed the same observations through a prism on Sirius, and he saw that some of the lines, some of these holes in the light of the sun were present in Sirius, others weren't, and then Sirius itself had holes in its spectrum that weren't seen in the sun. So that rules out the Earth's atmosphere. And I guess uh, most of you know what these are due to. There's a, there's a shroud of gas around the sun uh, containing atoms that absorb light. And so the, the, the light coming out of the, from the surface of the sun is captured by certain, by atoms in these very narrow resonance uh, absorption lines. This one here, very famous, the so-called Balmer alpha line, is actually, uh, there's, there's two, th this is a, a, uh, an absorption line of atomic hydrogen of which there are two others uh, somewhere in the spectrum that can be seen. And these are, uh, the analysis of these lines led Niels Bohr to his atomic theory that sort of started the, um, the real serious use of quantum mechanics in trying to understand the structure of matter. 
Uh, here is a, um, a light from my favorite scientific research institution, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It's uh, light from a synchrotron radiation source uh, whose director, Thomas Lucatorto, I see in the audience back there, uh, dispersed, uh, so this, this picture requires more explaining than it's worth to anybody else but me, but this is white light coming onto a diffraction grating, more about that in a moment, and then being dispersed onto a screen, and you can see the, uh, the colors of light that are produced in this particle accelerator, you know, reflect the same type of uh, systematic behavior you see in natural sources. Okay, diffraction, very important. I mean, here's a, here is a, here's a diffraction grating in wide use in the telecommunications industry. And uh, when, I put, when I put green light through it, you can see the original green spot is not just smeared out, but it's, there are, there are, it's separated into light going in very dis different discrete directions. How does this work? Well, here, here's a diagram, but I, the, uh, the director of the Smithsonian Institution was able to find this apparatus <laughs> in their basement. And I thought, if there are any old timers in the room, they'd love the sensation of some lecture standing, pointing at the, the uh, apparatus. I'll try my best. So um, here's a, um, this is not, you know, this is sort of a cartoon picture of a light wave. That is, it's like a, a, a point source radiating light. This is just a set of concentric circles uh, on, a, on a piece of transparent paper. But it, it's not dissimilar to what you might see if you threw a, uh, a pebble into a pond and saw these, this outgoing um, pattern of waves. And so uh, I have another such, you know, the same image. And when I put them on top of each other, uh, there's no surprise as to what you see. You just see the same thing again. But now if you separate, you separate the centers of the pattern, look what you see here. So originally it starts as a purely a circular waveform, but as you separate the centers, you see a concentration of ink in these lines that are going out at constant angles. So this is, this is a, a little, uh, let's say, a toy that shows how you can take isotropically expanding waves and then use this process of interference to cause there to be signals sent in certain specific directions. And the more of those, the more of those, um, those little scatterers that you have, the more peaked and intense is the radiation in particular directions. So it's a way of channeling energy that would ordinarily just be dispersed in all directions into highly specific ones. This is basically the, um, this is the, uh, the basis of the first uh, radio direction finders for guiding airplanes. You put a, a couple of antennas up to give a phased array and then there's, you know, there's intense, uh, there's a louder signal along certain directions at point where you want to go, and by varying the phase, you can also uh, program the guidance. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that, because it's probably the last overhead transparency projector you'll see in operation in Washington, D.C., or the United States this year. And so, yes, so that's, the, and that's how the diffraction grading works. It's, it's just a, um, it's a set of little rulings that constitute, they produce, uh, basically sphere, each produce spherical waves, but then the regular spacing between the gratings enables them to uh, concentrate the radiation. Okay, now, there, there's a, those are examples of some of the tools that have led to modern understanding. Now let's, uh, let's look at the discoverers. So uh, the first notable scientist in this story is, uh, William Frederick Herschel, who in uh, 1781 discovered the planet Uranus. I often give a version of this talk to groups of school children. I keep repeating, repeating 
the name of that planet, with particular emphasis on its second syllable, concluding with the question, what is the significance of Uranus? Would anyone, it's not directed in any personal sense, is there, is there something that stands out about this discovery or was it just like a one-hit wonder? I'll give you my answer. And that is, it's the first planet to have actually been discovered. All the others had been known to the ancients. You know, the ancients recognized seven planets. They named the days of the week after them. We still use that system. Well, in English, uh, you know, the Vikings kind of caused a few changes, but in Latin languages, the names of the week are largely come from the names of the seven planets known to the ancients. And all of a sudden, it turned out that there was an eighth. Uh, for extra credit, okay, I guess you can get, uh, what? Well, what's, uh, what, are the, what are the seven planets known to the ancients? Let's, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. That leaves two. The sun and the moon. And why are those planets? This is another thing I asked the school children. And they say, I said, what's the difference between a planet and a star? I said, there are these pla- there's stars and there are planets. What's the difference? Said, well, the stars are made of rock and the planets are made of fire. Or the other way around. One is hot and one is cold. But the answers I get are all sort of, you know, authority figure uh, facts that have been pronounced before the class. But how did the ancients know there was a of this difference. They didn't have all these learned authorities. Yes, exactly. And that's, I mean, so a colleague of mine whom I just, I told what I just told you, she's a community college teacher in rural North Carolina. And she said, well, the kids down here don't have that problem because they spend a lot of time outdoors and they can actually, they actually look at the sky, which you can't see so easily in big cities. But yeah, this, there's this fact, there's, but it's amazing. There are these two really separate systems. The stars are always in a completely fixed orientation. And they move, but always with the same relative pattern until you start looking really close. But the planets are, are moving around all the time. So that's you know, an example of some very... So e- even the empirical understanding of, from observations you know, led to a system of a calendar and timing which is still in use, and it helped, it helped point out the past to understanding irregularities. Okay, so that's, um, that's a, gr- a gr- you know, great significance of the achievement of the discovery of Uranus, as well as its practical applications and the use of its name. So here's a paper from Nature two years ago, plumbing the depths of Uranus and Neptune. When you see, when you see a, t- a paper like this, you wonder, why didn't they write two papers? Plumbing the depths of Uranus and then something else about Neptune. Oh, I guess this is one of these comments about the real paper. Atmospheric confinement of jet... Well, you get it. The other thing that... Um, I, with, but Herschel's role in this talk is for another monumental achievement which was the discovery that there was something that like light that was also, com- it was accompanying light out of the sun. Uh, and it was, a sor- it was a source of radiant heat. And he did this by, I think this is one of the greatest science experiments uh, of all. Uh, here's the original, here's the original apparatus. It's a prism and three thermometers. But I think a more accessible version is in this uh, uh, grade school science experiment that was fi- uh, fielded in Pasadena, California. It uses the same, same idea. So it's got a cardboard box with a slit cut in it and a prism. So the sunlight comes in through the, uh, the slit and you see the dispersed pattern, red, green, blue, violet, uh, on this sheet of paper here. and then a set of thermometers is put in the, in the field of the sun's light. And in fact, it, it's, it extends beyond 
the visible field. And now, I, you, what you have to pay attention to, these are thermometers here, and you can see the temperature, the temperature measured by the thermometer, the temperature of the light that's measured by the thermometer rises as you go from blue to red. And in fact, this last bulb is actually in the dark region uh, of the sun's light. So the even, and Herschel saw this more clearly, even if you removed the thermometer completely outside the field of the sun's light, it would, it would heat up. So even living in England, where the sun is hardly visible at all, there's this very clear uh, demonstration that there's some, that there was a form of, of heat accompanying the light from the sun. Uh, these days, here's another, uh, another reference that Dr. Luco Tordo will enjoy. There's a, a wonderful man, Charlie Falco, at the University of Arizona. He might have been a speaker at a place like this, so he ought to be. He's got this second career talking about optics and art. I think he wrote a bo book with David Hockney on how people in the Renaissance uh, formed images. But uh, I attended a talk by him, I guess it's about five years ago now, uh, and he talked about the fact that one could now get a very cheap, low-cost, high-resolution infrared digital camera. And he, in his talk, he cited this article that he just published in the Review of Scientific Instruments, which is a you know, venerable journal that talks about original construction of scientific interest, instruments. So I, I ran to the library and got this article, and uh, the punchline is contained down inside. He says, well, it, what, 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 the way that these new digital cameras work, you know, and that includes the models that are found on your phone, there's a, there's a semiconductor sensor that actually is sensitive to light from the ultraviolet through the infrared, but the, the manufacturers install a filter in the optical system that lets only the visible light through because grandma wants to see the grandkids like they look at, like they look in real life. If you've ever seen a picture of a human being taking the infrared, they all look really dead. Uh, but just by removing the, um, this light filter, you can get a broadband sensor. And then in the article he says, but that was too much trouble. I just bought one of these by one of the commercial vendors. It'll remove the, remove the filter for you. And here's an example. He's, he's been going around to museums with a, a regular um, uh, visible camera, regular digital camera, and then one that's modified to be infrared sensitive. And you can see the the great difference in structure, just from observation, here's a suit of Japanese armor, I guess it is, taken in the visible, and here it is in the infrared, and you can see features in the infrared that are sort of buried in the visible. And this, I mean, there are many, many other examples of this. Uh, let's see. So, let's, after, Herschel, after Herschel's experiment, it was understood that there's a patch of <clears throat> well, we're just going to, we'll just, we'll just reproduce kind of the condition of the experiment. There's light visible in this dispersed spectrum, and then there's out here, to some degree, there's heat. And, um, you know, why not just lay down an arbitrary scale? You can make it less arbitrary by making it the scale of the wavelength of light or something like that. And so if you believe that the invisible radiation is dispersed in the, according to the same type of rules that apply to light, then there's something here. What's the obvious question? What's on the other side? Huh. Tough crowd. So that was, um, that was uh, answered by this man, much less well known, a short life, somewhat unusual individual, Johann Ritter. Uh, he was, he is, uh, he had a philosophical belief in dualism. Now, when I first read this, I thought it meant that he settled his disputes with violent contests, but it means, apparently means something else. And I actually haven't really managed to understand it, but it's sort of like, if on one hand, then on the other. So when he read of Herschel's experiment, 
which he did rather quickly after it was published, he became convinced that there had to be something on the other side of, on the other side of the spectrum. I mean, that's what dualism's all about. And uh, I do not know the full story. He tried several, he tried numerous approaches, but one paid off. He just, he, he, uh, pardon me. He, in 1801, he discovered another form of radiation that you couldn't see that was outside the blue. And for those who complain about the four-page limit in physical review letters, here is Ritter's report of the discovery of ultraviolet radiation in its entirety. Uh, published, well, I forget exactly where, but I got this. This is the real deal. It's from Google Books. Um, here's, a tr here's a translation of the German, done by my colleague, Uwe Ar. On February 22nd, using horn silver, I found rays of the sun on the side of the violet in the color spectrum, but outside it. This radiation reduces stronger than the violet light itself, and the field of these rays is very wide. More about this later. Actually, yeah, that's what exactly it says, yeah, hasta la vista. There wasn't much more from Ritter, but, you know, the, 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 uh, the horse had left the barn. So, uh, now, horn silver is a name, I think, it's for something called silver halide, which is a compound, you know, known in the pre-modern world version of recording images. And this, um, this reduces, refers to the fact that the radiation, the radiation on the, um, on the blue side of things had very pronounced chemical action. So there's heat beyond the red, light, and then chemistry. I think I have, I have a few examples. So here, above the door, is a sign that reads, maybe you can't quite see that, a sign that reads, Exit Salida. You'll find that in many fine dining establishments in Washington. Uh, it means, exit means this way, Salida is Latin for the salad bar. So that when the lights, the lights go out in the house, the diners can still find their way to the salad bar by following these glowing stripes. I, I have a white light version here. I have a white light flashlight. It's not quite bright enough to excite that strip. Let's try it up close. But the point I wish to make is that, okay, I think you can see it there. So this white light, please, yeah, please keep the lights down. This white light, causes a glowing action in the strip. Now, what if I take a, a red laser pointer and illuminate the strip with it? Well, you see, actually, nothing happens at all. And then here is, where is it? Here's a green laser, which, by the way, is a lot, a lot brighter than the red, and it does virtually nothing to excite this strip. But now, just by changing the color, this is a, um, let's see. Here's the, if you can see that up there, that purple, that's the real, this is the real color of this laser. It's the same, it's a 405 nanometer laser. It's the same thing, same laser that's used in the blue, the Blu-ray uh, disc player. That causes an intense, intense reaction. So just changing the color you can see uh, you get a completely different response. And, and this, is, this is due uh, to, I mean, this is an effect of, like we see in the ultraviolet. Now, I uh, have another uh, two bottles procured at Harris Teeter. Uh, I, put, I put green light through the bottle, and you can... Um, you know, you can see some scattered light, but what you see there is green. Again, with the red, you can hardly see any scattering at all, but what you do see is still red light. 
I always, actually, the Blu-ray laser is not the last thing here, but it should do. And here you see, actually, you see the purple, one of these bottles is calling, has a, this blue glow. This blue is not the color of the laser. The color of the laser, uh, well, it's, it's, I have the same, the, the color of the laser is, is violet. But one of these liquids, you know, has, there's no effect due to um, red or green light, but with this, this, this violet laser, you see a dramatic change. And um, last, this is an, 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 an ultraviolet LED photodiode. Now, can anyone see this? Can anyone see the light? Yeah, you're not see what you're seeing is some stray, stray visible light from this. The ultraviolet is not really reaching your eyes. And once again, one of these, uh, one of these liquids is quite innocuous. But the other one, you see again this this fantastic, um, this fantastic production. The same color of light from the liquid, but a very different color of light. And I have these glasses that they say the lenses don't admit the UV. So you might question that if you, let's see, let's take a few experiments. Here's, here's you know, here you can see it. Now I put my, put the light, the glasses there. Can you still see the light? You can still see the light. But it does screen the ultraviolet because you see when I put my glasses there, it turns off the ultraviolet glow. I'm not making all this stuff up. <laughs> so that, that is the, um, that is, okay, this is like a weak example, I would say, a, weak, a set of weak examples of the chemical effect of the radiation that is towards and beyond the blue. It causes, cha it causes changes in the properties of the material. Ordinary, you know, the red and green light is maybe reflected by this, um, uh, the substance in these bottles. By the way, the... Um, the innocuous one is uh, club soda. Any guesses for what is in this bottle with its fluorescence? Tonic water. Is that what someone said? Quinine is a, uh, the molecule quinine is a strong uh, fluorescent refresher. And so this is, um, this is, um, actually I guess for this audience I'm going to skip the jokes about photography. I'll just, I won't dwell on them. So many audiences are not aware that there was ever a technique for making pictures except by the use of a smartphone. I mean, the digital camera I talked about is dead on arrival. But due to the wholesome influence of the internet, they are aware that we have many photographs from unbelievably ancient times. How can that be? So. I don't know if this wonderful man, Benjamin Silliman, might have been a member of this society. Is that a name known to anyone? Founder of the American Journal of Science, which I think is still being published. It was one of the, like, uh, I think Willard Gibbs published there. It was, it, it's probably the oldest continuously published journal of science in the United States. He's a bit of Polymath, and he wrote this be absolutely beautiful book, which explains physics in terms of common instruments that people should be aware of. So here's the, here's the story of the, you know, we say camera, what's that come from? Well, uh, camera is a Latin word for chamber, I guess, and there's this device, and I think this is what, what uh, Falco and David Hockney were talking about, how people could make very realistic pictures by drawing. Uh, you'd have a, you have a dark chamber, with a simple optical system that would bring an image of something down onto a sheet of paper, and then you could trace over it. And then photography, you know, writing with light. Uh, well, here's, you know, Silliman uh, produces the, you know, the correct answer, simply expressed. It was found you could take this camera obscura, that is the imaging system, the camera obscura, and then use a, a chemical medium, and the, the, the uh, photolytic reactions induced in the chemicals by the light would literally change the properties of matter.
give you an image. Uh, <clears throat> here's, a, here's a demonstration of that existence, of, in case you're not convinced, existence of ultraviolet using a common business, actually it's the National Institute of Standards and Technology business card, which is specially prepared to be a sensitive detector of ultraviolet radiation. So this is that dispersed, the dispersed um, uh, pattern. You can't see anything beyond the violet because your eyes aren't sensitive, but if you have a, let me see, I've got a business card from Dr. Robert L. Hershey, and uh, let's see if yours is also a sensitive detector. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, this is, you, you see a pretty, you see a pretty bright spot of light that's, that's emitted at this, this shift, wavelength shifted color from, uh, I guess he's a past president of the, this society, he probably knows a lot about this stuff. Okay, so this, as, as understood by, you know, in the early part of the 19th century, uh, this, is, this is a, you know, pretty interesting story about the light that we're getting, the radiation we're getting from the sun. It, it, it's capable of heating things or illuminating them or of, of transforming their properties. And um, in modern terminology, you know, what we say is that the sun emits particles of light, photons, and uh, there, you, you, can, you can characterize them by frequency of the oscillation or by wavelength. A wavelength is a more common. And so going from uh, stage left to right on this figure, the wavelength increases. Going the other way, the energy of the photon increases. And this, um, this lies at one of the you know, most amazing discoveries of 20th century physics, the photoelectric effect, a sort of foundational uh, event in quantum mechanics which established this important relationship, which is widely used, E equals H nu. The energy of a photon is proportional to its frequency nu, and the proportionality uh, constant is called uh, Planck's constant. It was invented by Max Planck also to discover properties of, also to explain properties of infrared radiation. So Einstein got the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1921 for his services to theoretical physics and especially for his discovery of the law of the photoelectric effect. And it was just last year. I mean, you probably all have these cheap uh, LED flashlights. I mean, they give them away at trade shows. Last year, the Nobel Prize in, in physics was for the invention of this cheap gimmick. This is the inverse photoelectric effect. That is, the application of light, uh, the application of electric current to a device directly generates light versus in the original photoelectric effect, the, uh, in, the, you know, this, the uh, interaction of light with matter produces electric current. And the people I know in the lighting industry say that this, um, these LED lights are going to be a true game changer. And it's not just because of some putative uh, improvements of efficiency, but the fact is they're, they can be easily configured with a sensor. And you know, if you look up, you'll see lights overhead in every building that you travel in the world. And those are now, you know, can be replaced by an LED package that is capable of conveying not only light, but of, of serving as a communications medium by you know, programming the, uh, the LED pixels to, uh, to perform you know, acts other than delivery of light. Uh, so um, I, I, think it's, I think it's time for some of the animals here. So, uh, I'll begin with a, a rather old story about birds and something I think you become familiar with uh, from the time of your childhood, that male and female birds of the same species, that is, you know, birds of the same species that mate and produce offspring, often have a distinctly different plumage. Here's the, the state bird of Maryland, the Baltimore Oriole, the male and the female. I mean, you've all seen these. And similarly, the a beautiful cardinal bird of Virginia, 
The male is bright red and the female is brownish. And this is, I think, you know, when, for example, it probably took Audubon or early naturalists in the United States facing all these previously unknown species to actually figure out which, which in some cases, which were members of the same species. Uh, here's an example from Southeast Asia. Uh, there, it's, it's almost a universal trait, but there are a few oddities. And w one that received early examination is this thrush that exists in Malaysia. And here's a, here's a Malaysian postage stamp showing two of these thrushes. Uh, and it illustrates something that even uh, the best trained ornithologists could not determine um, whether a thrush was male or female by looking at its coloration. And in the mid-1990s, there's an influential paper that pointed out that if one uh, observed these birds in the ultraviolet, you could tell the, way, the males from the females, though, you know, the first determination of that involved autopsic analysis of the subjects. It was so, so hard to tell male from female otherwise. But I think the paper that really launched things off was this paper by you know, published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B. Blue tits are ultraviolet tits. Now the blue tit, uh, one of which is shown here, is a small bird uh, found in Western Europe. And well, let's see, you scientists in the audience, you know what you do. When you write a paper, you present the story as if the biggest mystery of all time has just been cracked. And I'll just say, the title adequately conveys the <laughs> sense of excitement felt by the, um, the authors here. But I, I have the benefit of um, uh, corresponding with uh, Dr. Cuthill, a wonderful person. And they really, they, uh, they broke something open so this, once again, even experienced ornithologists couldn't tell the difference between male and female, but then by, just by the simple using observation of a, an ultraviolet source and an ultraviolet camera, they found that there was um, strong sexual dimorphism, that is different plumage patterns, present at this uh, wavelength of 370 nanometers, which is in the ultraviolet. And this, um, this was followed then by understanding that, uh, you know, based on physiological studies, that the birds have, this is, I don't know this is of all birds, but this is the emblematic avian visual system. So th the RGB part of it is somewhat similar to our own, though it's not as sensitive out far in the red. And then there's an additional receptor in the ultraviolet, where we have no visual acuity at all. And just to remind you, here's the, here's the human visual system. Uh, just a year ago, in Science Magazine, there appeared this paper on um, color vision in the mantis shrimp. This is a mantis shrimp. I understand it's neither a mantis nor a shrimp, hence the name. <laughs> but my, my correspondents in Southeast Asia say they're quite tasty. They, 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 this report, and once again, there have been a number of reports during the past decade of how many receptors the mantis shrimp has in its eye. But this one is certainly the most recent, the most numerous. There are 12 different receptors extending from an unbelievably low, a long, a unbelievably short wavelength of 300 nanometers up to 700 nanometers. And this study was conducted by a dissection analysis and then also um, the... Um, uh, what do you call it, electrophysiology of, of eliciting responses from uh, the different, different uh, wavelengths. So, you know, how is it that this humble animal has a, such a complex visual system? I think all, these are very much open questions. Here's the type of answer that's offered to that. I mean, it's a nice story, uh, likely true. The relationship between, not the birds and the bees, but the bees and the flowers. So it's now known that bees have sensitivity only in the green, the blue, and the ultraviolet. They have the three, three receptors, but not the red. 
And here is a, uh, the reflectance spectra of flowering bushes as a function of wavelength. And what you see is that this is, this is, the, this is the reflectance spectra of a, um, of a leaf on, in some plant, and this is the reflectance spectra of a flower. And so you can see that the, the highest visual contrast between, uh, between blossom and leaf occurs in the, in the near ultraviolet. So maybe the bees evolved their eye, maybe the eyes of the bees evolved to enable them to be more productive nectar gatherers, or maybe the plants got in first and started manipulating the bees, or you know, some combination, I don't know. Uh, this is, I think I'll conclude with this. Um, I mean, you could see this on YouTube, but I'll, I'll provide a narrative commentary. It's a, a BBC document, documentary, I think. Just it's beyond off, violet about and rainbow four lies ultraviolet. And it will show you the capabilities that it's are now available invisible to us, for ultraviolet imaging but not with you know, low-cost, reliable equipment. The invisible world of ultraviolet has many other things to reveal about the life of animals. Alongside the garden that we see, so this There's is an, an image invisible taken in all a garden of using ultraviolet radiation and, and secret codes, all designed false, to attract the interest the contrast, of passing insects. Instead of be matched the, the bee system, it indicates the contrast scene. That's because insects can't see our world clearly at all, but they can see ultraviolet. Take the honeybee. Many okay, flowers need I'm these. Gonna, I'm going to pass from that and the other things just to flip. There's, there's many, many examples that have come to light recently. Include, I mean, maybe you let your subscription to the Journal of Molluscan Studies <laughs> lapse, but in 2013, this is an amazing article of how how the visual appearance of these shells changes uh, when seen in ultraviolet or visible. Now, why that's happening, uh, I have no clue. And I'll, I'll conc here's, here's, a, you know, here's a sort of thing. Again, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's a little testament to this humble inverse photoelectric effect photodiode, sort of a possible application of the... Uh, discrimination against ultraviolet. So this is by a research group, I guess, in Hawaii, uh, who, who, rec who, who found that, uh, or, or believed that there was a, um, that, that sea turtles were sensitive to ultraviolet radiation at a, um, to a degree that fish were not. And so they, they, made some fish nets and strung them with these ultra cheap LED photodiodes. And here say, they say they demonstrated that there was a turtle avoidance rate. Um, so, I mean, it just shows when you have these, these wonderful modern tools, all sorts of ideas become possible that were otherwise um, just completely implausible. I'll just conclude by, you know, here's, a, here's what I understand is one of the leading um, uh, monographs on the principles of animal communication. And if you look at it, it has an amazing account of optics uh, signal pro uh, processing. So the, uh, the, the role of light across the spectrum in, in areas it feels like animal communications is becoming better appreciated. And I will conclude here and do my best to answer any questions. So we do have time for questions. Uh, we have a procedure. There are three people with microphones that will come to you. And when you get the mic, they will appoint the next person to ask a question. So if we can have the first question, please. In that so, room. Uh, we've been taught that you. Thank you. I'm Stephen Lambert, and I'm a guest. Um, 
I, we've been taught that UV light is terrible, it, you know, you gotta put on sunscreen, it damages your chemical bonds and all this. How can these animals have, what sort of structures do they have that they can tolerate and use UV light without uh, damage? Yeah, that's a, very, that's a good question. Why, you know, uh, how, how can animals exploit UV without getting damaged? Well, they're going to be damaged by UV in any event, like we all are. I'm not saying it's innocuous force of, form of radiation. And there certainly is, uh, of the examples that I've showed you, none of them are involved reception in the UVC band, which is the most energetic part of uh, UV radiation. I think between uh, two, 260 and 300 nanometers. And there, uh, that type of radiation really strongly, it has a very strong chemical reaction. So I think this, the simple message is, the, uh, first of all, a lot of these uh, animals don't live so long, so there's not a, not a lot of time for accumulation of defects. And secondly, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, they're, not, they're not necessarily um, getting a lot of, of light into the eye, and the, um, uh, the, the, the membrane, you know, the various tissues may not be that sensitive to the near UV which is where they're deployed. I mean, the humans have a UV blocker on the retina. I mean, you know, you don't want to look directly at UV, uh, but there is, you know, there's, there's been a protection uh, that's, you know, evolved over the years. So that, that's the best answer I have to that. Hello, I have a question. Name is... Oh, Mark. I'm sorry. Could you tell us your name and whether you're a member or a guest? Name is George Bailey, a uh, visitor here today interested in um, UV light sensitivity among various kinds of animals and also persistence of vision kinds of questions, meaning how fast they integrate an image or how yeah. fast a uh, sequence of images they could perceive. Is there a, a rule of thumb for that that you could do <coughs> or is it all over the place? Uh, no, I, I, don't, I don't have that answer. And I, must say I'm just a complete phony and a fraud. I don't know anything about animals, <laughs> but I'm very, I'm very interested in optical detection. So, so my, my interests have been in under, so the basic detection mechanism underpins the ability of the, of the, the, the creature to, to process optical information, whatever the part of the spectrum is. So that, that's been my focus. And you know, how we spot movement Right. I mean, I think that's a, involves a very complicated neural process that, you know, it relies on the, on the visual sensors, but it's hardly the, the only story. Maybe someone who actually knows something about animals could help me out here. Hi, David Rosen, lifetime member. Uh, ex uh, what was that discovery you said made in 2000 that made all this uh, animal vision research uh, more accessible? I forgot what you had said. There was some oh, well, I would say, uh, I, I didn't mean to say it was exactly in the year 2000, but I mean, part of it is the, um, you know, the revolution in uh, low cost and high, high resolution electronic imaging. The, the, this, the, the thing that's in your, the, the photo sensor that's in your cam, your cell phone camera is absolutely incredible. And by, by just using a simple, you know, relatively cheap filter to replace the default one, you can make um, you can make something that will produce these sorts of movies that you saw. So the ability of people to get uh, reliable sources of ultraviolet, you know, well defined in terms of spectral co coverage, and then to do imaging is something that's made most of these studies possible. And then, it, you know, it, it was soon discovered that were, there were all these issues associated with the different types of reception in different animal groups and the physiological studies that followed from that. So, you know, I'm not sure there was one cause, but certainly the optical technology uh, drive I, I had, a, had an influence. Stuart Sweet, I'm a member. Uh, so my question is, uh, what about uh, the other side of the, uh, the visual wavelengths, uh, any uh, notion of when our animals and plants can see infrared, part of the spectrum that we can't see? 
Well, there's, yeah, there's certainly, you know, there certainly is evidence um, of greater visual acuity. I mean, I showed some of these receptance charts and like the, the mantis shrimp has higher, higher spectral coverage. You, there, there are things that happen when you go in both directions. So as you go to the infrared, you get to, um, uh, uh, the photons become less energetic. You know, and at some point, they become indistinguishable. It's when the temperature is equivalent to the, the background temperature. They're not useful for imaging because they're flooded by ambient radiation. And before that, there are things like strong absorption by, let's say, water vapor in the infrared that means there's a, you know, there'd be some practice, because of the particular molecular structure of the things in the world, there are some reasons why certain wavelengths wouldn't ever be found, would be unlikely to be found to have an evolutionary advantage because, because the atmosphere is opaque. On the UV side, there's, you know, there's not an absolute limit, but certainly uh, UV is strongly, uh, UV with a wavelength shorter than about 250 nanometers is strongly absorbed in water. So there's not gonna be a uh, reason for, there'll not be a, a ter tremendous a a evolutionary advantage for an animal to, to have high acuity. Uh, Jim Griffin, a member. Uh, on the slide from the dualist, whose name I've over Ritter. There was a parenthetical remark about the field, which I found cryptic. I oh, yes? If we could look at that first. Of course, of course, discuss. of course. Uh, I never tire of looking at that slide, <laughs> as you can tell. Let's see, I think I've... Well, I made a comment. Sorry, let's see. There's something about the field being very wide. Or oh, some uh, set of adjectives that just didn't ring with me. Yeah, so the, I don't know why I'm so inept at this That's computer thing. For some reason. Uh, I I think it refers to actually. There's a, I'll I'll just show a brief film clip of the um, of that experiment being reproduced at Ritter Synchrotron. Let's see here. Let me get it. Uh, up on the screen. Is that any better? So this says, yeah, the, fi the field is, uh, the radiation induces stronger than the, the violet light itself, and the field of these rays is very wide. That means they extend well outside the visible. And I think I have a pretty good example of that here. Uh, we reproduced, I hope this photograph does it justice, but this experiment was reproduced at that synchrotron radiation source that I mentioned at NIST, and it was done by taking some uh, absorbent filter paper and soaking it in one of these uh, metal iodide solutions, and then just sticking it in the field of the rays. A photograph may not, not do it justice, but you can see there's quite a bit of darkening out here that's comparable to the, you know, the distance between the blue and the cyan, and, there's, and not much and, and in, in, in the experiment, when the you know, paper was examined, there's hardly any of this, this darkening due to the chemical action. So I think that's, I think that's my understanding of what it was referred to. Thank you. I'm uh, Timothy Thomas. I'm a member of the society. Oh, yeah. I'm uh, following Ritter's um, duality theory, I note that on the um, infrared side, I have non-visual sensors of that. When I walk into my kitchen and have left the stove on, I can feel it without looking at it through mm -hmm. the sensors in my cheeks. Yeah. I'm wondering if there is an equivalent non-visual detector of ultraviolet light that humans or other animals have invented. Well, it's a good question. I don't... I don't know a good answer. I mean, certainly, you know, the sunburn that you get is, is often uh, is caused by the near ultraviolet. So, I mean, you know, the, the trouble is usually you're in a condition of, of whatever, semi-sobriety or something. You only wake up with the problem. I mean, not personally, but I'm just saying the, the sunburn sensation usually sets in after the problem has already been caused. So, I mean, there's certainly... There's certainly some sensitivity to that. I don't, I don't know, but I don't know of what you might call the more 
inno innocuous sensors. But yeah, they, yeah, obviously people learn to avoid heat due to lessons learned early in life. And I guess you know, the problems that we have with UV are clearly more subtle. <clears throat> Carl Merrill, uh, I'm a member of the society. I can add a little bit to your story of Ritter in that oh. um, Carl Wilhelm Schiele actually discovered that light reduced ionic to metallic silver in 1774. Thank you. And furthermore, Wil Wilhelm Herschel, of course, mapped the northern hemisphere. His son mapped the southern hemisphere, but was interested in photography, and he was the one who developed sodium thiosulfate, which uh -huh. is what we call a fixer. But yes. more important, according to, for this story, is that he took some silver uh, halide paper and he, he put the sp shine the spectrum on it mm -hmm. and claimed that where the red fell, he got a bright red. Oh. And that he almost could get a good part of the spectra mm. just from the reduction of, a, of a ionic to metallic silver mm. directly on the, on the film mm. or on the paper. But yeah, you, you, you raise a good point. So if you look at photography, photography started developing very rapidly around this time due to... Um, uh, Talbot, for example, I think his first images, first photographic images were taken around 1817 or something Actually, like that. Actually, it was Herschel who had the, the sodium thiosulfate he shared without taking out any patent with Talbot. And that's uh -huh. what allowed Talbot to make those pictures. And Talbot did patent it. Mm. The scoundrel. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bruce Murray. I'm a visitor. Um, I, uh, I've read that um, the eyes of octopi seem to have uh, developed rather par in a parallel way to those of, of vertebrates. And I wondered if, but yet they have retinas that have kind of developed and things. I just wonder if they have some interesting uh, color vision properties. Is, have they been? Uh, I, do, I don't know. I don't know about that. But it's, I mean, it's certainly. Is, is this a is this a, a you know recent scientific discovery or something that you've been aware of for a while? I hear they have big brains too. So. Oh, tasty! So I encourage color, you know I encourage more color. research in octopuses, <laughs> octopi, I guess. Hi, uh, <clears throat> Daniel Tome. I'm a member of this. Could you speak up, please? Daniel Tome, I'm a member of the society. Uh, as you've described the uh, filters that exist on uh, modern uh, digital cameras, it sounds like a lot of information is being lost. Um, that it's just being uh, stripped away physically before it reaches the sensors. Is there a reason why that information can be retained and uh, handled digitally so that we can have uh, pictures that retain uh, the visual uh, information, also the ultraviolet and infrared as well. Yes, that's, um, so the, uh, you know, the early models of digital camera were concerned uh, with getting pictures that were, you know, suitable for human use. But I went to a, a presentation this past summer where I learned of the, um, the color sensor that is, that is now present, if you bought a camera in the year 2015, I think it's called the TCS 3034, and it actually takes the tendency that you suggest, first of all, it has, so, you know, the computer and all these other things have a 24-bit color system. This new color sensor, which costs about $1.50 in units of a million, has a 48-bit color sensor. I mean, it's like, and that's not twice the dynamic range. It's huge. And then it has four arrays, four independent arrays, each of four elements, which are R, G, B, and transparent. And I think the person whom I asked about it said it, it's basically a you know, CMOS sensor, but each of the R, G, B, uh, the R, the G, and the B have a, a dye sheet to filter out the, um, to, to, make, to make a narrow band receptor. But something like that, you know, which costs nothing, and it has this huge dynamic range, you think of the processing that you can employ 
because in some sense, the information is still all there, but you have different physical filters put on it, which are going to enhance your ability to just do things in software. So I, I, you know, I, I, my camera is like two years old. I'm just completely out of it. But from what I've seen, the, the, the quality of photographs that are being produced by the latest iPhone or something are just astonishing. I have a, a colleague who's a semi-professional photographer and who refused for, you know, she had one of these big bulky things. Uh, she makes money of selling stock photography. Uh, she refused for years to carry around a cell phone, but her husband gave her uh, whatever it is, the iPhone X, last Christmas, and she's just abjured the stupid old digital lens reflex. It's just, she says, the, the quality just, you know, it's just unbelievable what you can do. And it's, and it's not, and it's due to being able to dig out more signal or differentiate signal. It's not just having these fuzzy filters or something like that, so. I think the tendency that, you know, that there's a trend underway which is following what you suggest. Last question. Okay. Hi, I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a member. Could you tell us a little bit more about the demonstration you did with my business card? Oh, yeah. So the business card, <laughs> shall I give them your fax number or? Uh, fax number? Well, the, the business card. So this is, this is, the business card illustrates the same thing you saw with, um, you know, the, whatever my thing is, the quinine water. Uh, so the business card is made out of the business cardonium, chemical element, BC, and it absorbs, it's, it's, well, it's, it's actually doing much like the quinine does. The quinine isn't blue, it's colorless. But this, this radiation, but not the green, is sufficiently energetic to cause an, an excitation of a an excitation of an electron in the quinine molecule to an excited state, and then that electron stays in that state for a while and emits a photon, um, actually to another state. And act, so here's here's sort of the proof of this. If you see, you see what this blue ray does. It it emits. It causes the salad bar sign to glow in green. Do you agree? It gives a green color. Well, this is, this is green, and you see it does nothing. And the red does even less than nothing. I mean, it's just pitiful. So in order to get the green out, you have to put in something bluer. And in fact, if, you, if I were to, what, what you'll see if you take uh, light of different colors that are sufficiently reducing enough, as Ritter said, to cause this photo, uh, this, this light reaction, you'll see the color that's emitted by the salad bar sign is independent of the color that's used to irradiate it once you hit the threshold. And that's, that is basically a poor man's illustration of Einstein's photoelectric effect. There's a certain amount of energy that's required to cause this chemical transformation. Once you exceed it, you can get the transformation. And the way that you exceed it is to, is to increase the photon energy, which means making it more and more blue. You hit the blue threshold, the threshold for this excitation process, and then you'll, then you'll see it happen. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Back. So in appreciation for your taking the time to give this talk, I'd like to present you with this plaque, uh, well, a framed announcement much. of your uh, Good talk. Good likeness. And, uh, Just like what they have on the internet. <laughs> yeah, I wonder where I got it.